welcome to the show. Oh, it's so lovely to be here. I'm so, so excited. Um, as I was kind of just saying, I've been um, a big admirer of your work for a long time. Um, so you wrote a wonderful book, The Grieving Brain, The Surprising Science of How We Learn from Love and Loss. And I would love to perhaps kind of just really start, I guess, really at the bottom, and then we'll kind of just perhaps work our way out, uh, work our way up. Um, what is grief? I think of grief as the natural reaction to loss. So when we have a, a bond with a loved one, uh, then we form a, a sort of a we. And so if, if that person has died, that bond is, is broken and, and our brain has to understand well, what has happened, but it also means there's this loss, even sort of you could think of it as the loss of a part of yourself. And in the book, you make a distinction between uh, grief, the noun, and perhaps grieving the verb. How would you kind of distinguish between those two? I think this is a, a helpful distinction, although obviously we use those words interchangeably in, in typical conversation. Uh, but grief, yes, it's it's in that moment where you're feeling that loss that can be emotions and thoughts and and all sorts of things. But it really is that sort of wave, right? It's it's that time limited wave. Grieving, on the other hand, is the way that grief changes over time, right? So if I want to know something about your grief, I can just ask you, you know, how much grief are you having right now? But if I want to know something about your grieving, I need to ask you about the difference between how your grief was before and how it is now. And so for most of us, I think the reason this is helpful is we will feel grief forever because it's when we're aware of the loss of something so important to us. But grieving means that the frequency and the intensity of those waves of grief for most of us will decrease over time. So if you feel grief and it's been years after a loved one has died, there's nothing wrong with you. It means that this is a part of a process and you have up to this point been seeing changes in your grief. So see, so feeling grief in the moment isn't a sign that there's anything wrong with your grieving. Mm. And presumably, you know, you're a brilliant neuroscientist. I wonder, has research focused primarily on grief? as opposed to grieving? This is a great question. And I am, I am, you know, the this is the beginning, uh, the infancy of understanding the neurobiology of grief. The studies that we have done uh, so far with using neuroimaging scans uh, has focused on grief, that moment when people are in the scanner and they may be looking at the photograph of a person who's died in their lives. It's about what brain regions are sort of activated in response to that. We have less than a handful of studies where you have the same person who's had more than one scan so that we could see what's the difference between these two scans and say something about their grieving, the way that brain region activity increases or decreases or just changes where it is in the brain. So I'm very excited to have future studies that look at this. But we have a lot of psychological studies that look at grieving over time. So we do know a lot about the experience of grief and how it changes over time and how that differs between people. One thing that I was wondering was, what is the kind of the evolutionary reason as to why we grieve? I was I was trying to come up with some ideas, but I'd love to know kind of what your thoughts are on that. I think that looking at grief through this lens can be very helpful. I think most of us don't really understand why we grieve. And so this has been a long time curiosity of mine, really passion that's motivated a lot of my research. So this is what I think is happening. When we form a bond with someone, when, you know, we're an infant and, and we bond during nursing with, the, with our caregiver, that bond is 
stamped into the brain. It is encoded in the brain. This, this one is my one and only, right? This is the one who shows up when I need them. And, and this is the one I can turn to if I'm, if I'm, if I feel unsafe. When that bond is stamped into the brain, it means that there are certain reactions. And one of those reactions is, if the person isn't in your presence, as you become a toddler and a, and, a, and a child, if they're not in your presence, there's a simple solution to that. Go get them, right? Go find mama or make such a fuss that papa comes and finds you, right? So this is the attachment neurobiology, that invisible tether that means we keep reuniting with our loved ones. And then when we're adults, this applies, you know, when we've bonded with the person who becomes our spouse. Uh, recently, I was on a trip to London and my partner and I, we actually made a plan, right? Like, what if one of us gets onto the tube and the other one doesn't get on? How, how are we going to find each other again, right? Reuniting is so important to us as human beings. So if the brain has a solution for what to do if our loved one isn't present, the problem is, in these very rare instances, we cannot reunite with our loved one but be because they have died. But the brain keeps trying to use this solution for a long time, right? So it says, ah, you know, I, I wake up in the morning and I roll over and because of thousands of days of experience, I expect to see my wife next to me. And then that reality hits that, of course, she's died and she's not next to me. And so the brain takes a long time to really learn what has happened and to be able to predict their absence instead of their presence because this deep belief, this one will always be there for me, is so strongly encoded for us. Yeah, I got a couple of follow-up questions to that, but one of them was from what you said but there is that we form these kind of these neural connections, these neural pathways when we when we form an attachment to someone. So in that sense, presumably the only way to avoid grief is to never become attached to anyone or anything at all. Well, you could say that without love, there is no grief. No grief. But on the other sure. hand, attachments are so important to our survival mm -hmm. that we would not survive without them. And so that unfortunately is also not an option. Grief is a part of life right. as much right. as love is a part of life. Yeah. Yeah. Beautifully said. Um, I would love to ask because um, you talk, as you just mentioned, but they, it seems to me quite paradoxical in the sense that, you know, you kind of have this yearning for someone and when I kind of think about that, I almost kind of think of a, a, a state of pursuit, you know, a kind of yes. an activation with, with, you know, an activational system, a motivational kind of state. That yes. is that what I'm hearing? Perhaps grief has some kind of similarities with. Yes, I think it is, in fact, a motivational state. I think of it as very akin to thirst or mm -hmm. hunger right? These are also motivational states that let us know something you need is not here and you need to go and find it. And so we thirst for our loved ones. And, and while they're alive, that works very, very well. It's very important that we, we, you know, make use of that motivational system, that we repair relationships, that we continue to reunite with our loved ones, just as it's important that we seek out food and water. It's wow. the problem of the unusual event where that's not possible. Yeah, I, I think people will be listening to, to that and, and kind of as you were describing it, it, it sounds so powerful. And I think that so many people will kind of have that experience of, you know, of being motivated to go and find someone. But as you as we kind of talked about in this instance, they are there. So in that sense, I would love to ask what perhaps neurochemicals or brain regions are being perhaps lit up during these experiences i would i would be so interested to know well the brain is of course a very complex place 
And so it isn't, there isn't a grief region, so to speak. There isn't a single, you know, point that lights up uh, or, or there isn't a single brain region that has neural firing. But rather, there are many systems of the brain that are being used. And in fact, in part, I think this is part of the learning curve. So we may have a memory that this loved one has died. And so we're able to recall, you know, the memorial that we were at, or we're able to recall the memories of, of that loving relationship that we might have had with them, the many trips we took and so forth. So that's that's sort of the memory system that's necessary for, for relationships, for, for bonding and for, for grief. But this yearning specifically, that desire to seek them out, that's a different neural system. And so that motivational system is a part of what we call the reward network. And this reward network uses the most powerful chemicals that the human body makes so that that yearning is motivated with dopamine and oxytocin and, and cortisol and uh, opioids, right? The, 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 the sort of feel good drug we think of that we create in and of a, in ourselves, in our own brain. And it's because I think those powerful chemicals are at play that the feelings that we have are so intense. But of course, the memory and then that neurobiology of attachment, at some level, those can't both be true. And yet the brain can hold in mind both things at the same time. And so, you know, this is why we pick up the phone to call our loved one and tell them something that's just happened. And then, of course, the memory comes and we realize that we can't. Yeah, that's really interesting. And I was uh, had a kind of experience the other day where I was, uh, for whatever reason, I was stuck in my house. I was very socially isolated and my friends were all out and I ended up with this large craving for social connection. Yeah. And I was thinking that in and, it, in and of itself, that kind of social isolation is perhaps an adaptive state. But if I don't reconcile those needs over time, then that obviously perhaps leads to some of the maladaptive things. But one of the things that I would love to pick up on that you just said is, you kind of mentioned these reward centers in the brain, powerful chemicals, dopamine, oxytocin. When you put it like that, and with those things at play, there must then be a differentiation between grief and depression. Yes, we, that's right. We, we do believe there's a distinction now that can be made. But, of course, making it complicated is the fact that a person can have both grief and depression, right? Wow. You may know someone who has, say, grief, uh, sorry, uh, someone who has, say, depression and anxiety, right? We know those are different, and yet the same person can have both. So it works similarly with grief. We think that that the neurobiology underlying the grief response is different from the neurobiology that underlies the depressive response. And perhaps the easiest way to think about this is grief is very much about the loved one who's died. So depression, so yearning is not a symptom of depression, right? Yearning is much more global. It's this overarching feeling of, of sadness and, and guilt and feeling hopeless about the future, but about so many things, not about yearning for this person who's gone. So you can have both, but we know that we can distinguish them in terms of the symptoms people are experiencing, if we know which questions to ask, and also to some degree in the neurobiology. So recent neuroimaging studies are, are distinguishing the depressive aspects of the, of the neural circuitry and the grief aspects. Wow. Well, uh, sorry, I've got a question that's just come to my mind that is a bit of a U-turn, <laughs> but I <laughs> promise we'll get back on track. Do animals no grieve? Do animals grieve? Such yes. a great question. Yeah. So I actually work with a lot of uh, neuroscientists who study animals. And the reason is that there are animals, for example, voles, right? So these are these little tiny rodents that run around in North America. What's amazing about prairie voles is that they bond for life. They form a pair bond, and once they've fallen head over heels for this other vole, they will prefer to spend time with them compared to any other vole they ever come across. 
And so the reason that we think it's useful is that once that bond is formed, we can also see what's happening in their brain when they are then separated from each other. And the question of, so animal researchers call this loss. They, they really back away from calling it grief because of the sort of anthropomorphizing, right? Grief feels like a very human thing. We, we, we understand a lot about grief because of the subjective experience. We're not able to ask voles very much about their subjective experience. We don't know, you know, what their <laughs> yearning is on a scale of one to 10, but they exhibit many of the same behaviors that people who are grieving uh, exhibit, and also some of those same brain regions that we know are vitally important, say, in yearning in humans, are exactly the same brain regions where we see uh, changes during bonding and changes during separation in voles. So this makes me think that there are similarities, and perhaps there are even more similarities if we look at uh, some of the social mammals who spend a long time raising their children. So whales and elephants uh, show even more behaviors that, that look very similar to what humans do when they're grieving. Chimps is another example. Right. That's super, super interesting. Um, just to kind of gear us off to uh, back on topic, I, I apologize. I have so many thoughts. <laughs> um, in the book, you make a perhaps a differentiation between um, everyday grief to, to put it, and kind of complicated grief. I wonder, could you perhaps talk us through that distinction that you make? Yes, I think that uh, the, the term we've now settled on in psychology and psychiatry is prolonged grief. So I, I just always like to say that because we did used to call it complicated grief, but since we've settled on this term, uh, uh, that's the term that I'll use. But I mean largely the same thing as when you read about complicated grief. So typical grief the grief that the vast majority of us experience, we have these feelings, these waves, these thoughts, and so forth. And over time, with grieving, we see those waves become less frequent, less intense, and potentially even just more familiar, right? When I'm having a wave of grief now, I know better how to comfort myself than the first time I experienced, even the first hundred times I experienced a wave of grief. And so for most of us, we see this change over time. With people who have prolonged grief, we're not seeing a change over time in their experience. So you think about how upsetting it is in your life when you first learn that, that a loved one has died. You know, it's, it's hard to concentrate on things. It's hard to go to work. It's hard to get dinner on the table or to get matching shoes on your feet sometimes, right? But... For most of us, that abates as we go through this learning curve. For people who have prolonged grief, that level of interference in their life continues. And we don't even think about considering whether it's prolonged grief until a year after the death of a loved one. Because in that first year, everyone's having a tough time, right? Mm -hmm. And I shouldn't say everyone. So it's also okay if people aren't completely dysfunctional after the loss of a loved one. Many of us are expecting older adults, you know, we expect sometimes our older relatives to die. And, and when it is very sad, it, it also doesn't necessarily impact our life in the same way. But for people who are having prolonged grief, the experience is very different. And this is maybe only one in 10 bereaved people. So 90% of us do not experience this, but I could give you a couple examples. It just might be, you know, put it, make it a little more concrete. Um, there was a woman who actually lost her job as a reporter several years after her husband died because she couldn't get through an interview without crying. Or another woman who had kept the room of her daughter exactly the way it was when her daughter stepped out of bed the day that she died. And this woman would just sort of go to work and come home, go to work and come home. She had nothing else really that she was doing in her life. And she would spend a lot of time in this room. She had stopped sleeping in the bedroom with her husband. And so you can see how much that this type of grief is really impacting people. And that's why clinicians really want to be able to assess, is this kind of grief different? And therefore, how might we intervene? Are there perhaps any predictors or do people have perhaps any idea as to 
one would predict someone goes down a typical uh to, to not to minimize the experience but a typical grief experience versus yeah. a prolonged grief experience yeah so we do have predictors but i also like to point out that these are grief on average right mm. so it, it isn't necessarily clear that the the individual who shows up in the in the clinician's office this these risk factors don't mean that someone will have prolonged grief but on average we can say that there are a few predictors. So one of those predictors is, of course, having had mental health issues in the past. So um, that can be things like having had depression in the past, but also having had like separation anxiety or, or anxious attachment uh, in the past. It's probably using the same neurobiological system. Um, we also know that when the person who has died forms a major part of our own functioning. So the death of a child, the death of a spouse, these are more likely to result in prolonged grief because there's a lot more learning that has to happen. There's a lot more adapting. How, how am I going to retire without this person? This has always been the plan. Or how could I have let my child die, even when that's not necessarily accurate, but the feelings of my whole role in life was to protect this child and they've died. And so you can see how those types of relationships might increase the possibility of having prolonged grief. But it doesn't mean that for everyone who loses a child, it's still uh, it, it's still that the vast majority of us do adapt. Yeah, that's super, super interesting. Um, there's a couple of cases that have happened in the UK. Um, one that happened very recently with a woman by the name of Nicola Bully. Um, she was kind of presumed dead for, uh, I think, about three or four weeks, um, where the police were adamant that she had drowned in a river. Um, and I was thinking that for me, I'm a very optimistic person I have to say and if that was yeah. one of my family members I could imagine that even if it had been years within me I would still kind of have the belief that maybe they're going to come home in the case that perhaps someone is missing with no like definite closure is that perhaps more likely to lead to these sorts of complications perhaps this is a particularly difficult situation. Um, there's, a, there's a Dutch study, actually, of uh, family members from the Malaysian flight that mm -hmm. went down where the, the, uh, uh, the people on that plane were never found. And it does make grieving very difficult. And I think when you think about it from the perspective of the brain, although that sounds very sterile, I think it can help us to understand why, because on the one hand, you know, the police are telling you, sure, this, this person has died. But on the other hand, all of those attachment neurobiology beliefs, you will always be there for me, with emphasis on the always, it makes it much harder to believe that they're gone if there's no evidence for it, if there's no body. And, you know, you were mentioning animals earlier, even we see in chimps, for example, when there's a, a, a mother chimp and her infant has died, um, she will often carry that deceased infant for a long time, for days and even weeks, um, and in some cases even longer. And we think that it may be in part because she is trying to really understand that this has happened, that this is real, that this is what's happening. And, you know, many of our memorial and funeral rituals involve, you know, viewing the body. I think these reinforce the memories, right? They, they ingrain memories in us that this is real, that this has happened. And so if you're not able to have that memorial service, if, if you don't know that this person, you know, has been cremated or has been buried in a particular place, I think it makes it much more difficult. And we call this ambiguous loss. Mm, yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, that's really, really powerful um, to, to really consider. And I could only just imagine just how difficult in a lot of these cases that would be. Um, you mentioned something earlier that I, I took a note on um, that I would love to pick up on, which relates to a previous conversation I had with uh, Irvin Yalom, 
uh, a very, very famous uh, yes. psychiatrist, I, I believe, a psychiatrist uh, from Stanford. And it was after he released a brilliant book. Um, I forget the name of it, but it was it was excellent. It, yeah, I, I forget the name. I'll put, I'll put a link in the show notes for it. Um, but it was basically a very emotional story of, that him and his wife, Marilyn, uh, went on. I think they were together for 70 odd years, I want to say. Yeah. And she unfortunately passed away. Um, and he came on the show to talk very bravely about his experience. And one of the things that a lot of people commented on, um, that people said, you know, I was really surprised he said that. And at the time I was shocked, was he said that um I, I think he may even be in his late 80s or 90s, but he said that he'd been experiencing kind of abnormal. Uh, and I should I should clarify that, but he was said that he was experiencing some kind of sexual fantasies that he hadn't been experiencing for a long time, in lieu of the grief. Um, I I yeah I should I should have changed my phrase there. I don't mean anything anything malicious in that. But he said that he'd been kind of having these sexual fantasies, yeah. which he said he previously hadn't been having. Um, and you mentioned earlier that there's a whole array of behaviors that people can kind of. Uh, go through after um, kind of someone that they love dies is that one of them kind of sexual function is that something perhaps it's a really great great question I think there are so many things that happen after the death of a loved one that we're not expecting Mm -hmm. and this is not one that people talk about but think about it this way so you're opening up that attachment neurobiology. And one of the ways that we form attachment bonds is through sexual behavior. You know, it's through nursing, it's through mating. And and these are the these are the behaviors that really flood our brain with neurochemicals that enable us to attach. And I think the resulting possibility that when that attachment system is broken open because of grief, that we may see behaviors of this kind doesn't strike me as incredibly abnormal. And in fact, the way we express grief in different cultures varies widely. And so there are actually cultures where it is not uncommon for people to want to connect with living loved ones by having sex with them in the midst of this incredible, painful um, loneliness and yearning. So, you know, I think that is a very unusual expression in our culture. I think most of us are pretty shocked about that. I think there's also the difference between the experiences that we have in grief and the expression of them. So I don't think it means that um, we we're mandated to act on all the experiences that we you know have internally. But I think the honesty in talking about what is actually happening, what are you actually experiencing? There's a lot of judgment you know, from each other about, are you grieving too much? Are you grieving too little? Right. And, and just even figuring out what it is that you're experiencing is very challenging. So I think, you know, uh, this has been his experience. I think he is a well-versed person in, in human psychology. And, uh, you know, I, I think it's very brave, as you said, for him to be honest about that. Yeah, yeah, it was really powerful. And interestingly, um, in the kind of comments that we had, it kind of did spark some discussion about people saying, I had been having something similar. And, you know, thank you for sharing this, because I thought that I was on my own. So other people were coming together and kind of saying, you know, there's this kind of shame in this, perhaps in this factor that it's not well known. Is that? Yeah. Kind of, yeah. You know, it's funny, if you think about it from the perspective of these neurochemicals that are motivating us to reunite, how many of us, when our spouse has been on a trip and they finally come home, are we likely to have relationship with them, right? Like that is the most natural thing. And while they're gone, that we might fantasize about them. This is how attachment works. It motivates us. And then we're rewarded for being reunited with them. 
And so the idea that you might not, that you might have fantasies in the absence of this person is actually, if you think of it that way, feels pretty normal, right? It's just that you can't do anything about it in terms of them coming home again. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, uh, perhaps a common question that um, people would be perhaps wondering just in terms of grief, because we've kind of really, I think, gone through quite a lot. I mean, pretty short amount of time. I'm really impressed. Um, I, I would love to kind of um, wonder if, you know, a football player that I love or an actor or, um, you know, a, a, a I'm trying to think of a politician a or some like a musician, yes, yeah, yes. something like that. <laughs> but I feel kind of similar grief if they died, as opposed to perhaps someone that I do have a physical attachment with. Or is there a difference? Well, you know, this is such an interesting question, and I think it speaks in part to the question of to whom are we attached, right? Mm. And I think one of the most, you know, powerful. Um, examples of this recently was the death of Queen Elizabeth, right? Where many, many people experienced grief. And I don't think that was put on. I don't think that was, you know, enacted. And, and here is what I think is the reason for that. So I said at the beginning that grief is this natural response to loss. And it is a loss of something that is a part of ourself, right? So for example, if I describe myself as uh, a daughter, right? That's a word I would use to describe myself. That word implies two people, doesn't it? Mm. Right? Yeah. I'm using it to describe myself, but it actually describes two people. Well, think of the word um, spouse, the word best friend. These are all words that are actually describing two people, even though they are a description of myself. And what it means is when that person is gone, you're losing a part of how you function in the world. Well, what if I tell you I'm a British subject? That implies that I have a monarchy. And so it is a part of me. It's a part of my identity. And uh, you know, setting aside the issue of sort of whether we agree about the monarchy, whether we disagree about the monarchy, the regardless fact of the matter is that we've grown up with a queen and we had a relationship with that queen in whatever form that it was. In that sense, we're attached in the way that it informs the way we function in the world. And so you can think about this also with, say, a musician right? If you have a musician that you have listened to on endless repeat, right? Or the actor that you have binge watched for hours and hours and hours. And, you know, they've said things, they wrote things that really spoke to you, that really meant they understood your feelings. I think that's a form of attachment as well. And so that bond can also be broken and we lose, even if it's that we lose a sense of ourselves at 21, right? When we spent all this time listening to them and we went out to clubs dancing, you know, to their music, you lose a piece of who you were because they're not going to make music anymore. So we call this parasocial grief. And I think it's a real, I think it's a real experience that people have. Yeah, that's really powerful. Um, are there any known sex differences in terms of how severe the grief may be in males or females is that is that something which has been looked at this is this is an interesting question and we can think about this in a couple of different ways so one way is uh all of our mood disorders depression anxiety are more likely in women and so we find that prolonged grief disorder is also more likely in women, um, probably for similar reasons. And those reasons can include things like sex hormones, right? Um, that may contribute differently to emotional function, emotional regulation. But I think probably even more likely is that we're socialized different when we're socialized as boys and girls, as men and women. And so, even when the experience of grief is quite universal, I mean, across periods of history, across cultures, even potentially across species, 
the expression of that grief is very shaped by what our family said was okay, what our culture says is okay. And men and women get very different messages about what's acceptable, right? It is not acceptable to cry openly as a man in a situation that a woman, it would be considered completely acceptable. And so if we look at a man who's not crying, do we say, well, his experience of grief is different or simply the expression of his grief is different. I think that many men uh, express grief also through doing. So I know, you know, fathers who have experienced the death of a child and their entire drive is then to care for their, for their partner right, who is grieving, or to care for the, the other children in the family and make sure that they're okay. Is that less of an expression of grief than falling to bits? I, I don't think so. I think it's a different way of going about it. What I think is potentially harmful is when men and women aren't able to talk about their experience and accept that others' expression may look different from theirs, and it doesn't mean that they're not experiencing grief. So the wife who has lost that child uh, may see her husband sort of carrying on as though nothing has happened and may feel that he isn't experiencing grief. What's more important is that they're able to talk about what their experience is like and how they can best support each other. Yeah, really, really beautifully said. And one of the things that come to my mind as you were talking is we've kind of already talked about a few things that have kind of become perhaps a little bit taboo um and mm -hmm. i really really like that we're kind of talking about these things and, and you've done an amazing job of starting a brilliant conversation about these things and one of the things that i was thinking about as you were saying that was that historically um death has really always been very visible in kind of human life yeah. um throughout vast periods of human history yeah. and it seems like today we're kind of very sheltered from it i mean yeah. you know and kind of i even think about it in terms of the the linguistics of perhaps when someone dies they lost their battle with x or with y almost as if you know we have some say in uh you know whether we're gonna live you know it kind of phrases death as something separate from life when they're not yeah. so i wonder perhaps do you think that more awareness needs to be had about incorporating um death into a worldview that we have even from research we know that uh, from a large prospective study so this was a study of over a thousand people where they interviewed couples um, before either one was sick so they had to be over 65 but that was the only entry criteria and then they followed these couples for 10 years and when a spouse died then they re-interviewed the surviving spouse what's important about this is we knew a lot about how they were actually functioning before the death happened and most of our bereavement studies are retrospective um, so in this prospective study, one thing that was asked before the loss was about people's understanding of death as a part of life. And so that can be a, a religious viewpoint. How does uh, death fit into life? But it can also be just a philosophical perspective or even an agricultural sort of perspective, right? This is all the circle of life and this has to happen so that life goes on in the bigger picture. And what was found was that people who had a way of incorporating death into life had a, a framework for how that worked, at least in the abstract. It meant that when they had a loss experience, that they tended to have less severe grief. Now, there are some caveats to this. Often, the death of a loved one kind of shakes up our religious understanding, for example. Um, it, it makes us question uh, issues of meaning in life. But having thought through some of those questions first does seem to enable us to think about this specific loss in a different way. I think you are correct that in our culture, uh, we have created ways to make death more invisible. Um, although the quantity of deaths that we see that are fake on television is extraordinary, <laughs> but they are not, but they're not realistic, 
right? We don't see the grieving person. We often don't even see, you know, the, the, the way the body is after a death. Whereas through long periods of history, infant mortality and maternal mortality were simply a part of life every single year in a community. So I think that putting it out of our, our vision has made it easier to avoid. And it's very anxiety provoking. I understand why we would want to avoid it. But this is the flip side that by understanding how death really affects us and what grief really feels like, it can mean that we live more meaningful lives. It can mean that we treasure the preciousness of our relationships differently, that we feel we must seize the day because we don't know of our own mortality when that will come. It may mean that we want to do things to honor the values of a a person who we loved who has died and, and want to be better people because they would have wanted us to be better people. And so I think that incorporating Uh, awareness and conversations about death and dying and grief is important. And I am actually seeing a sea change. So I've been teaching a course, the psychology of death and loss since 1999. (laughs) And I can tell you (laughs) that it has changed a lot. So people are willing to talk about this. You can find good information on the internet now in a way that simply was not true years ago. And that while our experience of some kinds of death is very masked, on the other hand, in the United States, we have an incredible amount of gun violence. We have to train our children how to uh, handle an active shooter scenario. Mm. We have an incredible number of drug overdoses and uh, deaths by suicide. And in those same psychology of death and loss classes, I have many more students who have experienced the death of a peer or a sibling or a cousin than I did in 1999. So I think death does not affect all communities equally. And therefore, bereavement is a health disparity as well. Yeah, sure. And when you were talking about kind of how we can perhaps incorporate death into our worldview as a way to perhaps make life even more beautiful, I have to say I had had hair stand up on my arms. That was a a, a beautiful, beautiful point. And I've just got a couple more questions. I want to be Mm. super respectful of of your time. Um, One of the things that I would love to ask is um, that for a lot of people that have had the experience of being around someone that is going through um, the loss of a loved one, a lot of people can, I think it would be fair to say that for a lot of people, it can be quite an uncomfortable experience. Yeah, People worried about saying the wrong things. And often this leads people to really not say anything at all which in some ways may even be worse. (laughs) Um, Yes. So I would love to know perhaps before we jump into like actual ways, systems, uh, ways to actually look at dealing with, with grief for the people that are around people that are dealing with, with, with these emotions that we're talking about. Do you have any tips or advice for how to approach those conversations? I think the first thing to know is, it's incredibly difficult to be Mm. with someone who is suffering. And so those feelings you're having are not unnatural. It it is anxiety provoking to figure out what you might say in the face of terrible loss. And I will tell you that I have had thousands of conversations with people who are grieving and I still say the wrong thing. (laughs) And the thing is, There is no right thing to say. What is more important is that you are with them and that you say something, Mm. even if that thing is, I'm not really sure what to say, but I want to be here with you. I think many of us have the misguided belief that our role in supporting someone who's grieving is to cheer them up. That is not the goal. First of all, that's unlikely to work. And second of all, if the person has to pretend to be cheered up by you, they often then only feel more disconnected at a time when they're already feeling lonely and uncertain about how they're feeling. So I think it is more important to think of the goal 
as to simply be there with them, potentially to lend them your hope. I see that you can't imagine a time in your future right now where you are able to lead a meaningful life, but I can see that for you. I don't know what it looks like, but I know that it will happen and I will be here with you until we get there. And also telling them, you know, you're doing better than you think in an impossible situation. So I think you know, supporting and comforting is is more important. Your um, there's a British comedian whose name I'm blanking on, but I'll I'll give you the the name for the show notes. Has written a beautiful thing about being bereaved and how she had wished that people had been willing to talk with her. It's okay to use the person's name. You're not going to make a grieving person more sad because they are already sad. You're not going to insult them by talking about memories of the person or how crummy it is that they have to go through this. So I think thinking about it that way can be very useful. And also to recognize when people are grieving, their emotional volume dial has just been turned up in general. And so often people who are grieving are very angry they're not angry with you. They're angry that this has happened, but it may come across as being angry with you. So a simple concrete example, I had a, a, a student who told me that her elderly neighbor, the, the husband had died. And that at Christmas time, her boyfriend went over to the, the widow's house and said, listen, I know your husband used to put up Christmas lights and uh, you know, I, I, I would be delighted to put them up for you this year. Mm. And the woman at the door said, I don't need that and slammed the door. And this man thought, oh God, I've done totally the wrong thing, you know? And about 24 hours later, the neighbor came over and knocked and said, I'm so sorry. It's just so hard for me that he can't do this anymore. I would love to have you come and help me. I just feel so angry sometimes when I'm reminded of his loss. And so I think that helps to sort of give you a sense of there's there's nothing wrong with them being angry with you. It just is what is going on for them right now. And if you can sort of give yourself and them a little bit of grace and and just sort of be there again at another time, that's probably the best way forward. Yeah, sure. And and there's one of your quotes that I've been thinking about uh, when I was preparing for this. There is no pain so great as the memory of joy in present grief. And that's a really, really powerful quote to, to ponder. Um, so we kind of just talked about but they perhaps how to best support people that are going through this. What if we ourselves are going through this? Well, perhaps would be some best approaches. I think it's important to remember that almost all of what you were experiencing is probably normal. <laughs> yeah. Most of all, right? If you imagine that your loved one is in the room with you, that is normal. If you feel incredible guilt or incredible blame and anger at this person who's died, that is normal. Uh, so I think that's probably the first thing. The second thing is to know that you're on a learning curve, right? There's nothing wrong with you. You're just on a learning curve. And that learning curve is probably going to take a long time. So often seeking out people who have had a grief experience, who are able to talk about it, where they have, you know, sort of healed enough that they're able to share with you, but not take over the conversation. Um, that can be very helpful to feeling more normal. Um, and then I think having a big toolkit, I like to say, having a big toolkit of coping strategies. So in any given moment, it isn't that one way of coping with a wave of grief is better than another. So it can even be okay in the moment to completely avoid thinking about the fact that the person has died. I'm, you know, the, the woman who, uh, you know, goes to her daughter's tennis match and says, you know what, I'm going to put out of my head that her, her father has died. I'm just going to cheer for her and focus on that. Like nothing has happened. That is pretty, you know, strong avoidance. And it's perfectly appropriate in that moment. Mm -hmm. Now, if she uses that same coping strategy every day, that's probably eventually not going to be so helpful to her adapting and, and figuring out how to live life in a meaningful way. But in each given moment, trying different strategies of how to cope is often very helpful. 
I love that. I love that. And so much of the conversation we, we've spoke about today is really one of the main reasons why we started the show, because we wanted to have these conversations. And I had a conversation with the brilliant psychiatrist, Ian McGill Christ before. And I remember him telling me that if you have, if you make the most powerful experiences in life explicit like death, then you rob it of his power. And I really feel like kind of we we have done that today. So I really, really can't thank you enough for coming on the show, for sharing your amazing research, uh, your wonderful book. Um, and I before I ask you to sign off, tell these guys where they can connect with you, where they can get all of your stuff, which we will, of course, link below, is the last question we sign off all of our podcasts with. What makes a life worth living? I think in many ways, that's such an individual choice. Maybe that's part of what makes the life worth living is that you come to discover it for yourself. Very, very, very well said. Um, Mary Francis, where can our audience connect with you? Um, and where else would you like to send them or any perhaps closing thoughts? There is, a, um, you know, the book is available anywhere books are sold. Um, uh, I have a website for my laboratory at maryfrancisoconnor.org. Um, no punctuation. Uh, and backslash book, you'll find the book there. Um, if you are interested in prolonged grief disorder specifically, um, if you Google Columbia University and prolonged grief, you'll find a center there uh, with really excellent public and professional uh, information uh, for, for both the public and for professional clinicians. Um, and I would point people toward that as well. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for having me. It's such an important conversation to bring to people and scientists can't do this without people like you.